Since 2009, dealing with bailiffs has offered a helpline for people facing bailiff action or have been wronged by bailiffs. Whether bailiffs defrauded a debtor or innocent person, we show you the schemes and scams as well as the trickery played by bailiffs when collecting an unpaid debt. We also explore the possible reasons the police say bailiff crime is a civil matter and why they palm you off with making complaints to a private company, that is, action fraud. And why action fraud never seem to investigate any bailiff crime at all. Is bailiff crime really the wrong type of fraud? When a bailiff gets payment in full from the debtor, they only earn £90. That is the whole of the debt, plus all the fees, being £310 on top. Otherwise, they earn nothing. Low pay encourages bailiffs to breach the rules, and some bailiff scams even net them thousands of pounds. If you think bailiffs commit fraud under their own intuition, you are wrong. Everything a bailiff does is learned in the classroom and on the street with a training partner. Everything bailiffs do, whether covertly or conspicuously, has a reason. We show you the bailiff scams and how to save yourself a lot of money. Bailiffs must give the debtor a notice of enforcement before taking control of goods. Paragraph 7 of Schedule 12 of the Tribunal's Courts and Enforcement Act 2007 says, An enforcement agent may not take control of goods unless the debtor has been given notice. This is an example of the first page of a notice of enforcement. The law also states the prescribed information a notice of enforcement must give. Regulation 7 of the Taking Control of Goods Regulations 2013 says The name and address of the debtor, the reference number or numbers, the date of notice, details of the court judgment or order or enforcement power by virtue of which the debt is enforceable against the debtor, sufficient details of the debt to enable the debtor to identify the debt correctly, the amount of the debt including any interest due as at the date of the notice, the amount of any enforcement costs incurred up to the date of notice, and the possible additional costs of enforcement if the sum outstanding should remain unpaid as at the date on the notice, how, and between which hours, and on which days, payment of the sum outstanding may be made, a contact telephone number, and address at which, and the days on which, and the hours between which, the enforcement agent or the enforcement agent's office may be contacted, and the date and time by which the sum outstanding must be paid to prevent goods of the debtor being taken control of and sold and the debtor incurring additional costs. This example here is not a valid notice of enforcement. It is used by a bailiff company when they are not sure where a debtor lives and they put it through the door at addresses, they think the debtor is living it and see if it gets a response and validates the debtor's address. If the debtor innocently contacts the bailiff on this document, the bailiff will ask the debtor to do a security check, under the pretense it is for the Data Protection Act, and ask them to confirm their postcode. If the debtor gives the postcode, then he may as well ring the dinner bell for the bailiffs to come round. The bailiff starts enforcement, knowing the debtor has not been given notice, and charges enforcement fees, which the law does not allow. The law only allows bailiffs to charge fees when they use the prescribed enforcement provisions, which is Schedule 12 of the Tribunal's Courts and Enforcement Act 2007 and Provision 7 states. An enforcement agent may not take control of goods unless the debtor has been given notice. That means, if the bailiff has not given the debtor a notice, then he cannot charge any fees at all. Because, Regulation 3 of the Taking Control of Goods, Fees, Regulations 2014 says, these regulations apply when an enforcement agent uses the Schedule 12 procedure. Therefore, if the debtor has not been given a notice, he can raise a fee dispute. That is done by applying a detailed assessment hearing, which is asking the court to examine whether the fees charged by bailiffs are lawful. The application is made under Civil Procedure Rule 84.16. Ambushing debtors without giving a notice of enforcement. 
The document shown here on the right, is also an invalid notice of enforcement. In fact, it's not even a prescribed enforcement document at all. This is used to see if the debtor is living at an address the document was given, and again, to validate the debtor's current address. It is a form of debtor tracing, and it is not allowed. The law is silent on whether bailiffs can trade as a tracing agent, but guidelines do prohibit it. In 2014, the Ministry of Justice published a document called The Taking Control of Goods, National Standards. And, at paragraph 12 of that document, it says, Creditors must not issue a warrant knowing that the debtor is not at the address, as a means of tracing the debtor at no cost. Bailiffs are financially motivated not to give debtors a notice of enforcement. Otherwise, the debtor can simply settle the debt, before the bailiff attends, and adds further enforcement fees. Bailiffs selling debtors' vehicles, and pocketing the balance of proceeds. Bailiffs are quick to take debtors, cars, especially, if it has significant value. When the bailiffs sell debtors' cars at auction, usually through online auctions such as eBay, the regulations state how the proceeds of the sale must be divided out between the creditor, the bailiff, and the debtor. Regulation 13, sub-paragraph 4, of the Taking Control of Goods, Fees, Regulations, 2014, says. The proceeds must be applied, pro rata, in payment of, the sum to be recovered, and, any remaining amounts recoverable in respect of fees and disbursements payable to the enforcement agent in accordance with these regulations. If the proceeds of the sale of the car, are greater than the amount outstanding, the bailiff must pay the balance, or surplus money, back to the debtor. This is where they don't. Instead, they pocket that money, and hope the debtor doesn't notice. The debtor may contact any new keeper applying to the DVLA for a V5 new keeper logbook and ask them for evidence of the price they paid for the car and who they bought it from. Then, the debtor can apply for a detailed assessment hearing to ask the court to examine where and who has possession of the balance of proceeds and explain why they were not remitted back to the debtor or why the bailiff lied about the auction sale price of the car. Bailiffs pocketing money in this way could well be an offence under Section 4 of the Fraud Act 2006 because, he occupied a position of trust, and must not act against the interests of another party, which he is entrusted. Section 4 of the Fraud Act, 2006, says. Fraud by abuse of position. A person is in breach of this section if he, occupies a position in which he is expected to safeguard, or not to act against, the financial interests of another person, dishonestly abuses that position, and, intends, by means of the abuse of that position, to make a gain for himself or another, or to cause loss to another or to expose another to a risk of loss. Section 4, subsection 2, further states. A person may be regarded as having abused his position even though his conduct consisted of an omission rather than an act. If you report the fraud to the police, they will either say, it's a civil matter, or, they tell you to report it to action fraud. Charging debtors high storage fees to store their vehicle in a pound. One of the biggest money makers for bailiffs is charging debtors high storage fees after taking their car to a pound. Some bailiff companies charge £12 a day or £360 a month to store a car. One bailiff company charges an eye-watering £48 a day to store a car in a scrapyard premises. That is £1,440 a month. You can rent an entire house for less. The debtor has to pay those charges, otherwise they cannot get their car back. Bailiffs use the car as a lien to get him to pay up, or they will sell the car, which leaves debtors no choice but to concede to the high storage charges. The debtor can then apply for a detailed assessment hearing. That is to ask the court to examine whether the bailiff's fees and charges are lawful. On the application, the debtor's solicitor will put the bailiff on strict proof that he paid those storage fees on a date before taking the money from the debtor when reclaiming his car. That is because the fee regulations only allow bailiff to recover disbursements which must be actual and reasonable. If the bailiff is unable to show the flow of money, proving he has paid or was disbursed for the storage charges recovered are actual, then the debtor may recover them. That is because the bailiff charged a disbursement he did not pay. The rules for bailiffs to recover disbursements from debtors is Regulation 8, subparagraph 2, of the Taking Control of Goods, Fees, Regulations 2014, which says. The following disbursements are recoverable provided that they are reasonably and actually incurred. 
The cost of storing goods, which, have been taken into control and removed from the premises, or highway. The debtor can apply for a detailed assessment, to recover storage fees, which the bailiff did not pay, up to six years after the money was taken. This is the reason why bailiffs do not make a controlled goods agreement. A controlled goods agreement is a legal contract between a debtor and a bailiff, that allows the debtor to keep possession of his goods, provided he pays the debt according to an agreed written schedule. Bailiffs earn no money by doing this, so they are quick to clamp and take vehicles, because they make huge profits from the towing and storing of debtors' cars. Charging debtors, multiple enforcement stage fees. This happens when the bailiff is concurrently recovering lots of traffic contravention debt warrants against the same person at the same address. The enforcement stage fee is recoverable from the debtor when the bailiff first attends the debtor's premises. Currently, the fee is fixed by regulations at £235. When a bailiff has more than one warrant against the same debtor, the bailiff is forbidden from multiplying the £235 enforcement stage fee by the number of warrants. Regulation 11, of the Taking Control of Goods, Fees, Regulations, 2014, says. More than one enforcement power available against the same debtor. The fee recoverable in respect of the enforcement stage, or stages, and the sale or disposal stage respectively, is to be calculated as follows. The fixed fee for each stage may be recovered only once, regardless of the number of enforcement powers to which the instructions relate. If a bailiff has charged the debtor the enforcement stage fee more than once, he can apply for a detailed assessment and ask for his costs. The debtor's solicitor will prepare the hearing bundle and include the regulations that states the bailiff may only charge one enforcement stage fee and evidence of the money taken or charged by the bailiff that shows he charged the debtor the enforcement stage fee twice or more. Charging VAT on fees and charges. The fee regulations do not provide for bailiffs to recover VAT from debtors. There is leading case authority, that stated. There is no contractual relationship that creates a liability for VAT between a bailiff and a debtor. Not all bailiff companies are guilty of charging VAT, but if a debtor can show that a bailiff has taken money as input tax, or charged it, then he can apply for a detailed assessment hearing under Civil Procedure Rule 84.16. It is common for bailiffs recovering high court writs to charge VAT to debtors. Also, bailiffs might add VAT to their vehicle storage fees. The procedure to recover illegal VAT charges are the same, nonetheless. This should only be done by a competent solicitor who has the necessary skill and knowledge in detailed assessment rules and tax law. The debtor does not need worry about the costs of the solicitor, because their fees are recovered as a costs order against the bailiff company or sometimes the creditor the bailiff is acting for. If a creditor, such as a council or authority, is ordered to pay a debtor's solicitor's costs, the authority is protected by the bailiff company's public liability insurance, so getting paid is very straightforward, once the detailed assessment hearing is complete. Dealing with bailiffs offers a free service for debtors who have been charged VAT on bailiffs' fees or charges. Debtors can be referred to a solicitor to apply for a detailed assessment hearing at no cost to the debtor. The debtor gets paid, and doesn't even need to go to court. Demanding debtors, to pay in cash, or by online bank transfer. Bailiffs often demand payment in cash, or, by online bank transfer, for a number of reasons. The bailiff company's card payments terminal has been suspended by their bank for abuse of their terms of service. Or, the bailiff knows he is doing something illegal, and it is trying to avoid a chargeback. A chargeback is reversing a financial transaction that was made using a credit or a debit card. It returns the money taken using the card, back to the cardholder's bank account. Bailiffs have wised up to this, and try to avoid using card payments. But this could be seen as an own goal for the bailiff industry. Debtors, who paid cash or by online money transfer, cannot reclaim their money by chargeback, so it leaves them the only remedy, which is to apply to the court for a detailed assessment hearing. When a detailed assessment into the fees and charges goes against the bailiff, it is usually very expensive for them. 
the costs order for the debtor's solicitor, which often runs into many thousands of pounds. That is due to the complexity of the process a solicitor must follow when they apply for a detailed assessment hearing. The comfort is the debtor gets his money back, but only as far as the illegal fees are concerned. If a person, who is not the debtor, has money taken from them, which they did not legally owe, there is a different legal procedure to follow to recover that money. That is because, only a debtor or a party to the debt, may apply for the detailed assessment hearing. And, non-debtors are not a party. Reporting bailiff crime to the police. Reporting bailiff crime and fraud to police will almost certainly be rebuked as a civil matter, even if the crime is very obvious. Take for example, a bailiff carrying a police-like warrant card. This is a genuine police officer's warrant card. And this is a fake. Bailiffs often carry police-like warrant cards to give the impression, to anyone who is less informed, of what an actual warrant card looks like, that the bailiff is a police officer or has police-like authority. This is a bailiff flashing a fake ID, made to look like a police warrant card. Now do you see the resemblance? Bailiffs are issued photo ID by the court, which looks like this. These are genuine bailiffs photo ID. They don't look much, do they? As you can see, it has the bailiff's mugshot, and it is signed in wet ink by a judge. If a debtor demands to see a bailiff's photo ID, they rarely show the genuine enforcement agent's ID card. Instead, they show another form of fake ID, the body-worn camera. This is, typically, what a bailiff's body-worn camera looks like. And, it's here, the bailiff plays a secret trick. When someone asks the bailiff to show his ID, they gesture to their body-worn camera. It is actually called, a video badge. Because when the person closes in to look at the bailiff's video badge, the video camera takes a mugshot of the person looking at it. So, instead, always, use your phone and take a picture of the video badge instead. And, demand to see their court-issued photo ID card. And, take a photo of that as well. Back to the police, and bailiffs using police-like warrant cards. If a bailiff uses any police-like article to mislead anyone that he is a police officer, then he commits an offence. Section 90, subsection 3, of the Police Act, 1996 says. Any person who, not being a member of a police force or special constable, has in his possession any article of police uniform shall, unless he proves that he obtained possession of that article lawfully and has possession of it for a lawful purpose, be guilty of an offence and liable on summary conviction to a fine not exceeding level 1 on the standard scale. The law also says, wearing police-like uniform, is also an offence. Section 90, subsection 2, of the Police Act 1996, says. Any person who, not being a constable, wears any article of police uniform in circumstances where it gives him an appearance so nearly resembling that of a member of a police force is to be calculated to deceive shall be guilty of an offence and liable on summary conviction to a fine not exceeding level 3 on the standard scale. So, we have a whole team of bailiffs, all wearing police-like uniform and no arrests have been made. Since 2009, dealing with bailiffs, has seen hundreds of clients report bailiff fraud and embezzlement of goods to action fraud. But the response is always. It's a civil matter. Dealing with bailiffs has a solicitor that specializes in police corruption. When charging a police officer with an offence, it is under Section 26 of the Criminal Justice and Courts Act 2015, which states The police constable threatens to exercise, or not to exercise, a power or privilege of a constable, the threat is made for the purpose of achieving a benefit or detriment of another, and, a reasonable person would not expect a constable to threaten to exercise, or not to exercise, the power or privilege for the purpose of achieving that benefit or detriment. That means, if a bailiff commits a fraud or a crime and is reported to a police officer and that officer does not arrest the suspect, he commits an offence. If you have been a victim of bailiff fraud in the last six years, or had money taken by bailiffs which you did not owe, then dealing with bailiffs can help.
we have specialist solicitors who can recover your money, and it won't cost you anything, because their fees are recovered from the other party. We hope you enjoyed today's video, so please subscribe to be told of our new bailiff advice videos whenever we upload them. Until then, if in doubt, keep him out.